Everyday Samurai, Episode 36. Greetings, friends, and welcome to Everyday Samurai, in service to your liberty and the security of a free state. Today, we are continuing our conversation with James Williams Sensei of Nami Ryu Aiki Heiho. So far, we learned how Williams Sensei evolved from a boxer and kickboxer through Aikido into a system of combat strategy premised upon edged weapons engagement. If you have not yet listened, I would highly encourage you to listen to that episode at everydaysamurai.life forward slash 35. And while you're there, subscribe to the podcast so you'll always be up to date with our current offerings. On the show notes page for episode 35, you can also find links for connecting with William Sensei's work, including his unique tactical knives based on the authentic Japanese style at williamsbladedesign.com, as well as his site for traditional samurai swords, tools, and other accessories at buge.com, that's B-U-G-E-I.com. His online video dojo in Nami Ryu, as well as announcements for his upcoming seminars, are available at systemofstrategy.com. I've also link to one of my favorite articles on the eye and the mind there, where he emphasizes the importance of keeping the eyes soft, especially in a crisis, because it staves off tunnel vision and allows the mind the maximum capacity to process information. Those familiar with the killology work of former Army Ranger and psychologist Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman will recognize the references to physiological responses the body undergoes during the extreme stress of combat. Grossman describes how the life and death circumstances experienced Experienced in combat trigger involuntary reactions, including nature of the call, in anticipation of the potential violence awaiting there, and begins to ride that wave of hormonal responses occurring below the surface of awareness. The body must adapt to these changes, and periods of hyperactivity demand a corresponding period of underperformance or even hibernation to recover. Recognizing the heightened vulnerability that occurs once the dust settles and you breathe that sigh of relief after an engagement is what prompted the samurai dictum made famous by warlord Toyotomi Hideyoshi to, after the victory in battle, tighten your helmet straps. People naturally want to relax after getting the all clear. In fact, their body demands it as a natural outcome of physiologically responding to stress. It can come from combat, of course, yet also anticipation of conflict, whether real or imagined. I once had a law enforcement colleague that would get totally amped up even when handling innocuous situations like affecting the arrest of a totally compliant subject. As an example, one of the first things we would do when coming on shift was check the list of warrants issued by the court that day. And on one occasion, I provided backup for taking in a teenager living with his parents who had a fresh arrest warrant for some traffic violations. We went to the parents' house around dinner time, knocked on the door, and talked to the mother who, in turn, immediately produced the son to us. Everyone was aware of the warrant and the son willingly complied with our every command offered no resistance, and submitted to handcuffing before being placed in the back of the patrol car. Once the car door was shut, I noticed how my colleague's breathing appeared as though he had just finished running a 100-meter dash. His hands were shaking as he radioed arrest confirmation to the dispatcher. And I couldn't help but recognize the physiological clues of someone dealing with a surging cocktail of stress hormones. This was a cop that loved the thrill of the chase and prided himself on the quantity of arrests he made regardless of the quality. He was also a bit out of shape and a heavy smoker at the time, we worked together on patrol. Repeatedly getting an adrenaline dump like this, often several times throughout a shift, without any outlet for dissipation, leads to stress adaptations in the body. These show up over time as immobility and injury. As an aside, my colleague later wound up getting shot in the line of duty due to a mid-level manager's tactical incompetence and dealt with a long road to mental and physical recovery. His personality was totally transformed from that experience. He has since moved on to the private security industry and has confided in me that he characterized characterizes himself as part of the problem during that phase of his law enforcement career. Now, I'm not claiming that what happened to him is a direct result to him being out of shape or having those type of stress responses. However, I do assert that stress will show up. It will manifest in some way in your body and in your life. Dealing with all those stress hormones without a positive outlet is unsustainable, which is another reason why you want to stave off that adrenaline dump as far as possible when dealing with stress. Further, stress responses can even come from mundane tasks like driving, having a verbal confrontation with a colleague or a loved one, stress at work, deadlines that need to be met, or even unresolved painful memories. In fact, dwelling in the past or anticipating the future are threats to both your success in life as well as prevailing in combat. James Williams Sensei describes anticipation, expectation, assumption, and judgment.
judgment as the four horsemen of the apocalypse because they draw you away from the present moment of reality. Staying fully present in the eternal now is an essential skill for warriors. Yet, cultivating this capacity requires training. Releasing resentments of the past as well as fearful anticipation of the future is part of the mental conditioning process just as much as offering no muscular resistance to sharp steel is an essential physical skill for prevailing in edged weapons combat. A key component for both mental and physical conditioning to succeed in combat and every other area of life is to actively release pent-up stress from the body. James Williams Sensei often says that tension in the body is white noise in the mind. It dulls your ability to perceive reality and respond appropriately. Therefore, taking time every day to actively wring out stress from the body is every warrior's responsibility, and that is exactly what the Primal Stress Program is designed to do. Primal Stress uses joint mobility movements body weight strength training, and yoga-styled active recovery techniques to deliberately purge the musculonervous system of stress-adapted postures so that you can thrive in the zone of constant flow. Primal stress is the best program I've found to address the demands warriors face, and I don't care how you make your living, you are a warrior, right? Even the most cursory glance at today's political landscape reveals everyone needs to be ready for the battles ahead, whatever that shows up as. And the security of a free state actually demands the whole body of the people, that includes you, to be armed and disciplined, to stand strong against violators of civility and constitutional order. So get into the flow of fitness at everydaysamurai.life forward slash Primal. That's everydaysamurai.life forward slash primal. Let's face it, you need a fitness program that supports and aligns with the kind of combat training found in samurai lineages like Nami Ryu. Primal Stress will get you there without expensive equipment or gym memberships that you don't have time for. There's even a bonus on special breathing techniques for rapid recovery after a high-stress event that you can use anywhere. Get Primal Stress today at everydaysamurai.life forward slash primal. Okay, I now present to you part two of the martial journey of James Williams Sensei. Now is a good time to introduce the listeners to the way that you begin most of your seminars. And it usually, from my experience, is a beginning with you holding up a blade and saying, this is the truth. Why do you do that? Uh, very tough ask. When people think of martial arts, you know, when we look at that character and you live in Japan, you can speak Japanese. When you say the art part, people tend to have a different look. So I bring up the sword and the edge of the sword. Very tough ask. This is the truth. This is what defines this. This is a live or die thing. This isn't somebody's fist. This isn't throwing somebody in, right? And then I'll take eight and a half, 11 piece of paper and I'll just cut it in half. Like, okay, who's tough? Who's tough? You know, and I've got some hardened guys that have seen some stuff. Well, nobody steps forward to be tough because they all recognize well, nobody's tough when you've got a big sharp piece of steel like that. I said, okay, so now we've defined the parameters of what we're studying. You know, learning how not to be in the way of a vector of force. This is this whole art. Mm-hmm. So our fundamental movement is different than normal movement. Most martial arts, this is how I explain it myself, and I'm generalizing slightly, but like I said, I've done a lot of stuff over 60 years of doing this. That doesn't include going to Catholic school with the Irish, where I learned a lot of stuff as well. You learned uh, Christian charity and compassion, right? All right. I learned when to punch him, when to hold him, when to fold him, when to walk away, when to run. You learned about the cross-hand grab. Listen, you stuck together, and guys that wouldn't stick together, even if we were all going to get our ass kicked, got no support in the neighborhood. You learned a lot of lessons, who to walk with, you know, who friends were or not. You learned those things because they were really important. I didn't learn how to fight very well because I had no one to teach me, but I learned a lot of other lessons. Anyway, going back to martial arts, Mars was the god of war. War is about killing people and breaking stuff. Art's ability to do it to somebody else without having doing back to you. 50-50 gunfights, back and forth fist fights, blocking stuff. You know, some of these edge weapon things I see where these guys are going back and forth blocking them with small blades. You're going to be cutting the shit out of each other. And destroying your blade. A lot of these are small knife stuff, so you're not going to hurt the blade. But there's nothing you're doing that's going to stop that person in the moment. And I can speak from experience. Being cut by somebody in a fight you may not even know. I've had more to me once. You don't even know. By the way, I'm not suggesting that, but you know, you walk away from one of those things and you're able to walk away and you go, don't ever be this stupid again. So... We don't do that. When I have people say, you teach knife fighting, I go, well, 
I don't do tonight. I mean, that's really stupid. I can speak from experience having survived. You know, don't do that. I said, we teach solutions with different tools, but we don't fight about it. And you know that kanji could be read military science. Like my system of strategy, that heiho kanji is the same hansa, you know, used in Sun Tzu's Art of War, right? It's Art of War. We're not talking fighting. We're not talking contesting. We're talking about war, which is a whole different deal. So your paradigm is different. The sharp edge of the blade means, man, doesn't I'm not tough anymore. How are you going to take a, a cut from a 30-inch piece of, of steel? <laughs> not very well. The whole ethos is different. But when you start with that, the solutions down the food chain also become more apparent and more efficient. You know, going down to uh, trade at Naval Special Warfare Training Attachment, working with some of the guys, one of the common comments I'd get is, well, sir, you're so fast. And I'd go like, well, it's not that I'm fast. It's just that I'm doing very little and what you're seeing and what I'm doing are not the same things. Now, does it take a amount of investment to do that? It does, but it means that somebody like myself in my 70s can still go and teach high-level special operations guys hands-on that I couldn't do. I couldn't go into a boxing gym and get in the ring and start boxing. I'm still pretty reasonable, but body and everything is just not going to work like that anymore, right? So if you keep going down one path, and age takes it away from you. You know, can I help people? Sure. You see me hit the bag, you know, in the video, and I probably don't look my age, and I look fairly competent. And I am, but I couldn't go back and start doing that that way. And I don't use that for solving problems. I know one thing, having busted my hands more than once on people's heads, I can hit really hard still. I'm going to break my hand if I hit somebody in the head. I guarantee it, right? And it's not very fun when you break all those bones. And you've seen my hands in big knots of busted bones up in a man. I was a slow learner, by the way, everybody. Don't think I was a fast learner to use this. <laughs> So we're the beneficiaries of a distillation of years, of decades, if not. Of stupidity and foolish choices. <laughs> but eventually you settled on the samurai-related arts and understanding that it all begins and ends with edged weapons. And that's how you built what I've heard you describe as your operating system. So how did that come about? Okay, so yes, as Kuroda Sensei said, you're using techniques and movement that are no longer used. Modern arts don't use that movement. There's a couple good articles on that. So because you're, you're programming yourself to literally function differently, to not use contractual muscle strength, to movements that disappear, or in order for a human being to walk up and down stairs, to do anything, there's programming that takes place way deep in your brain, past your conscious mind. What you can show is you can show something that the person recognizes and responds to with no conscious mind. You can tell them ahead of time you're going to do it. When you move fast, they can't re program that. And yet what you're doing is not what they're seeing. I've got my notes from when we did that five day seminar together. And one of the things that I wrote down is that you are telling us that we are becoming the conscious architect of our consciousness. Right. So what happens with things is most of the programming that you have for your life with that stuff takes place by the time you're about six years old. And we don't need to get into neuroscience. People can look that up. And then you go through most of the rest of your life with that. And what we're doing here is deciding, well, I want to be different. I don't want the inhale startle reflex. That's an ungulate response. That's a, that's a prey animal response. Talking with Dr. Dan Siegel, who is a, one of the leading neuroscientists at Esalen Institute a few years ago where I went and listened to his talk. He's really exceptional person. And we're walking back to the lunch place at Esalen and I go, you know, doc, your survival mechanism will get you killed. And he goes, well, it's there for a reason. I go, yeah, survival of the species. It's not for survival of the individual. If you want to survive in an individual, you've got to take more personal responsibility. Otherwise, it's the luck of the draw. There's a great book by Amanda Ripley, uh, The Unthinkable. I probably mentioned that with you guys as well. And the great thing about that is it explains how people, most people are functioning when something like happens 9-11. And they go into ungulate mode. They go into what we call sheeple mode. And that's most people. People say, well, what does sheeple mean? Why do you say that? Well, when I was kickboxing and boxing out of uh, the Institute for Better Health in the 70s, we lived in Northern California and we lived outside in, in a little tiny village. I mean, it's tiny, called Bodega. And it's sheep country. And you never saw a stray dog for more than half a day. They were always shot. People say, oh, that's so terrible. So what they do is they'll see sheep and they may have never been bit. They don't even know what they are. They'll move towards them and the sheep move away. 
The faster the dog moves, the faster the sheep moves. So the dog will chase him. He may not even bite him, but the sheep will injure themselves or kill themselves. So the dogs are shot. And that's most people. And you can see in the modern world, you have a lot of information, but you have a massive amount of disinformation, propaganda, and all fear-based stuff. We also have a lot of subconscious programming taking place. And I'll relate a story. It was conveyed to me by my first field training officer when I got into law enforcement. One of the things that law enforcement has to deal with now is people that enter into the profession after years of watching TV they see violence on TV or in movies or in video games and they're not physically involved in it so when they actually do get into an altercation they go into observer mode and they forget the fact that their partner is actually involved in a serious altercation you know that is so true and I look at myself as being lucky when I grew up fighting was a pretty common thing there was however a serious code you one on one you stood up for yourself if the guy gave up that was it. You didn't keep beating on them. There was a whole code to it. You didn't pick on people smaller than you. There was a whole lot. That thing has gone away to a great part in, in America for the worst. We are so removed from the having to do things in consequences of action that, you know, and this is a consequence based universe. You know, there's a book written by creator. It's called creation and everybody gets to learn from that book. And it's a cause and effect thing. If you stick your hand in fire, you get burnt. You keep it there long enough, you get damaged badly. If you do this, this happens. If you do that, that happens. If you treat people poorly, that's also going to create other problems. So every part, how I treat myself, how I treat other people, how it works when I walk out in the mountains here, which is a short walk from my front door, right? All of that is teaching if you can listen. When you remove yourself from that and you get artificial environments like movies, You know, there's nothing on TV that's real. And some things they get right, like temperature sometimes and sports corps regularly. But most of it is just opinion blather. And a lot of it's very biased and fear-based because the fear response gets people to react. That's why I call it paid programming. It is paid programming. And a whole lot of it is literally paid programming. And news is just a television program with actors who get their talking points when they're getting their makeup put on. So you don't go for there for information. However, having real world experiences allows you to weed through and find real information. Not having those doesn't. Like what most people think about firearms or combat or anything that comes from movies. Well, you know, it's not like that at all. And so they're making their decisions not based on real world stuff, but based on biases. And we know when you get out in the real world, your biases and your opinions don't matter at all. On the contrary, they'll get you killed if you're not careful. You have to pay attention to what really is and shape yourself to that. And so fundamental to the study of Namidu is I need to get myself out of the way. I need to also develop as a human being. I always tell people, if you're going to start this, bring a shovel. What for? Well, you're going to be shoveling your own, which starts who knows when. I'm going back into being zero to six years old um, and trying to see what of that came forward for me and a lot of the tendencies that I have because I couldn't see and I didn't know it. I literally had 2400 plus vision. I couldn't see people's eyes from five feet away. I didn't know if you were looking at me unless you turned your head at me and I assumed that, but you could be looking over my shoulder at somebody else. I couldn't see your eyes. I didn't know that. I didn't know until I it was in second grade on North 42nd Street in Omaha, Nebraska. And I got my first pair of glasses and I'm looking out the window on a rainy day and I'm seeing individual blades of grass from like 15 feet away. I was stunned. I didn't know people could see. So what impact did that have on me growing up? What well, had to have a lot. If I want to continue to grow as a human being, I've got to get in and deal with my stuff. Nothing that's done to me from the outside. You have to take responsibility for yourself. That's why I put up that thing about Frederick Douglass, great American, or when I quote Booker T. Washington, great Americans who came out of very difficult circumstances. They were slaves, for God's sakes. And yet, by their will and their effort, they rose up and got respect from everybody. Well, not everybody, because some people cannot get past their fears. And fear makes us hate. Fear makes us denigrate people. Fear makes us hurt people. Fear makes us hurt ourselves. As the Bard said, of all base passion, fear is most accursed. You're fundamentally, if you're going to do this reprogramming architect of your consciousness, you have to start with your fears and how they affect you. Some of the fears will go away when you shine the light of consciousness on them. Some fears are there for a reason. 
You know, when you walk out in the veld in Africa and all you have is my hisho, which is a big knife, 13 inch blade. It seems really big in Nairobi, right? When it's under your shirt, nobody can see it. And you walk away from a vehicle, that knife gets smaller and smaller. And you guys probably heard me say this. It's kind of like the stuff below your waist that starts constricting up, pushing the blood above your neck going, it's dangerous out here right? It's a real pucker factor. And you really have to pay attention in Africa because there's always a predatory eye looking at you, whether you're in the city or out alone, wherever you are, you have to pay attention in Africa. You pay the price. That's just how it is. When I was in Panama, we used to have a phrase saying, the J is not neutral, meaning the jungle hates you and will kill you if you're not paying attention. Well, the interesting thing is with a lot of the disinformation that goes out that this is a benign planet that's all here for us. It is not. This planet does not care about us. There's times when it's really benign and it's great. And there's times when it will kill you dead from all kinds of reasons. Okay. We learn how to make this planet survivable, right? We learned how to make fire. We learned how to take things and make them. And we live in a time now that is the best time to be alive for human beings ever, ever from a standpoint of comfort, safety, longevity, medicine, travel, you name it. Opportunity of all kinds. Opportunities our ancestors couldn't even dream of. Doesn't matter who you are, where you are. Is it perfect? It's not a perfect place and it's never going to be. Is there injustice? There is. Is there inequality? There is. But take from some of our great American ancestors like Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass and literally change it for yourself on your own effort and make people respect you because who you are. I got the Colombian orator and I, you probably saw my post when I put that up. I sure did. And I downloaded the Colombian orator that very day. I bought the book because if a 12 year old slave boy could take his 50 cents, you know, he was hanging out with a bunch of poor white boys and he said they treated me just like them. They were also downtrodden in that sense of the term, but they could go to school and they were reading it. So he got that book and he said, I would read it every chance I get. And a poor backwoods disadvantage, right? Abraham Lincoln, both of those men, both of those great Americans could take that, read that, get inspired to change their circumstances. Then any of us can do that. And that's empowerment. You go there, you get the information, you study, you train, you put your, and so the study of NAMI was fine is a study of empowerment. And it's not the study of being the best swordsman or the best fighter, right? It's a study of empowerment by a, an ancient methodology that handles every aspect of human consciousness and shows you that there's a completely different way of functioning other than the fear-based contractual whatever. I got to the top of a food chain using the former. There's no comparison with where I am right now and what that does for me as a person and also my health and my function in my 70s. When people see me, they have no idea that I'm as old as I am. And it's relaxed movement because it takes the tension out. It's not having the stress inside, recognizing the reality of things that are happening in the world. And I've seen plenty of stuff. But also understanding that this is how this is and why. In my cosmology, there's a reason why all things, and that includes aging. There's a purpose for aging as far as I'm concerned. I look at the world so differently than I did 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years years ago. We're either here to learn or there, and there's a purpose to it or there's no purpose at all. So what can I learn from aging? What can I help people with from aging? And why do so many people my age, how come they're old? Most, they're old because of all the fears and all of that stuff that eats away at you over time and posture and all of that and the tension and the rigidity in the body. And that doesn't have to be that way. You do, however, have to do the work. What is the work? What is the specific? Because you've mentioned something about going back to the first six years of your life and, you know, success coaches, even Dan Pena of Quantum Leap Advantage, you know, very money focused. He even says you have to go back and change the programming that was instilled in you when you were a child below the age of seven because so much dysfunction has been installed, whether it would be, you know, witting or unwittingly from your parents and your environment, etc. A lot of things that create dysfunction in your life were installed in those first seven years of life. And then here we have you saying it. And some of them by the best of intentions. So my son, Christopher, doesn't like spiders. When he was a year, a little over a year old, we sold the house in Encinitas and bought property. And property was about the same amount of money. So we moved a trailer on there for a while because, you know, we were making an investment. And when he was probably two, two and a half, there sitting out, he and my wife are sitting on the bench and she sees a black widow spider and jumps up with an eek. And Chris looks at mom, afraid, looks at this little bug, pounds it with his fist and squashes it. <laughs> 
he's kind of proud of himself. Don't you ever do that again. <laughs> well, because we lived, there's scorpions on the property. There's rattlesnakes on the property. There's black widows, you know. Well, we want, well, this is day we made him afraid. I kick myself to this day. You know, as a parent, I, I always tell people, you think you knew fear before you're being a parent. When you're a parent, you really understand, right? Because it's not about you anymore. And so parents are going to do that for all kinds of reasons, sometimes consciously, sometimes not consciously, right? You have those things. What this is, this study, because we're not using contractile strength, and when people, a lot of people say that, but they don't really understand it and they're not actually doing it. So when they say soft and they use words like IQ or some of those things, that doesn't mean that they understand it the way we're saying it. Taking you into a different world, concepts like musoku no ho, I can't push down on the floor when I start and stop. Well, nobody walks like that unless you spend a long time practicing. Learning how to not access your normal physical responses. And we, we define normal as fear-based. We define natural and we're, we're creating a, a shared reality here. As Pete Blaver would say in his book, The Mission, Men Mission Me, we're creating a shared reality. So we understand what we mean by these words specifically. For us, natural is faith-based. And that's not a belief system. Belief systems are different things, even though they use that word. You know, we depend upon gravity, absolutely. We, we depend upon oxygen transfer. That's where the faith part comes from. And that allows you to let go of these fear responses. And listen, I was an undefeated kickboxer in the 70s, not because I wasn't afraid. I was afraid, but I was afraid of failure. So if you hurt me, it's like throwing gas on the fire. It brought me closer to my bigger fear, which is failure. That's okay for some things, but boy, that runs into a ceiling pretty quickly. But it was something I need to do in the situation in Australia when it didn't happen was so disappointing. Things always work out for the best. They may not seem like it in the short term, but there's a lesson needed to be learned and I needed to move away from that and, and follow a different path. Okay. I'd exhausted that path. Whatever I needed to get out of it, I'd gotten. It was done. Time to move on. When you have a system like Namadu or Shinbukan or Yunagidu where you have to solve physical, tactical problems without using strength. Okay. You have a backboard. Meditation, all that sounds good. The problem is, and I was in a Saivite Hindu monastery. You asked about the power of now with Eckhart Tolle. And so I was in a Saivite Hindu monastery in the early seventies. And basically what Eckhart Tolle did was take that ancient Hindu teachings and put it into, and an excellent job and put it into modern language and modern concepts that people could understand. Learning how to actually be in the moment of now, what we tend to do and you watch people all the time as they're going down the street completely unaware in the moment, their brain is in some other thing that they're going to do or thinking about something that already happened. It's not in the present time. If you're not in the present time, well, where's your life experience coming from and how vulnerable are you? You're enormously vulnerable. The classic example, you're walking around with a cell phone in your face and then somebody comes and steals your purse or mugs you because your brain isn't even close to where things are. You're not paying attention to the environment. Now, if you did that out on the belt, well, you'll just end up being eaten by various critters until nothing's... That's just what happens out there. And that's what would have happened if you were wandering in North America or wandering... You know, you have to pay attention. That pay attention is actually the life that's really happening, not the movie that's playing in your head. So when you're doing something like Namidu, you know, you've got a consequence. Is this working or not? Can the person stop you or not? And so you, you're constantly getting feedback so that you can make corrections. I say you couldn't learn to play basketball if the backboard and the hoop moved every time you took a shot. You have to have a con constant thing to go back and forth so you can see where progress is being made. And am I really moving in the direction? Am I really letting go? So when I'll have somebody stand strongly and I push on, I'll push them, can't move them. And then I'll let them feel me, let everything go. And I just move them like with a few ounces of pressure. When I quit getting in the way with my fear-based stuff, things work way better. I wish I would have known that a lot earlier in life, but I had to go through all the stupid first to understand that there had to be or there is a better way in the process of that. And when the aging process comes, you know, I still run, I still lift, I still hit the bag, I still lots of things. As you can see from the video, pretty competently, especially when you consider my age. However, age is taking stuff away. That's just the way it is. Can I run as far as fast? I cannot. Can I do other things like that as much? I cannot. Is my recovery time longer? Yes, it is. But with the study of Namidu and stuff, I'm actually learning to do less faster than age is taking it away. So my actual function is going up with that. Now, there's huge lessons to learn from that as well. And that's one of the advantages of age. If I stayed 27 young male, young, dumb, and full of, as you would say from the military, right? I wouldn't learn this. I'm convinced. 
you have to go through parts of life. Having children is a huge learning experience from all kinds of angles. You know, when I read the Iliad as a teenager, it was all about glory and battle and victory. And then you read it later on when you've seen the consequences of war. And it's about stupidity and death and sorrow and destruction. In this journey, we're getting a chance to look at things. Are we gaining wisdom and knowledge from that? And are we working on ourselves with a methodology on a daily basis Or are we just going through it and suffering the consequences, which is true for most people, I think. I'm not saying they're not learning anything, but without a methodology that you have, that you practice on a regular basis, it's going to be very difficult to end up in a particular place. And with that, I think we're coming back to what Musashi said, that the way is in training. So what you need to do is what do I want? How and why? How do I get there? If you're up the food chain enough to talk to some of the people that make big decisions like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, you might ask them that same question. What do you want to accomplish? I made a list out a while back with all this as I got very frustrated, right? What are we trying to accomplish? Is what we want to accomplish even accomplishable in the circumstances? Do you understand the society well enough to know that? I would have to say with all three of those places, nope. If it's accomplishable, do you have the resources to accomplish it? If you have the resources, are you willing to spend those resources? And I would say, we don't know. You know what I mean? When you go down that, there would be, you go like, okay, so what are we doing now? That's one of the questions that I always ask for anybody who is proposing any kind of public policy is what size check are you personally willing to write on a monthly or weekly basis to have this program put in place? And I bet you 99% of the American population would not spend a single dime so that Syria could be free or Iraq. And the thing with Syria is fascinating. I mean, under Assad, all those little minority groups there were protected. Because he's Alawite, he's a minority, he needed them. You change that, and those minority groups are going to be what happened with Turkey. I mean, you had... Well, look at Libya right now as well. Yeah, well, you had the Armenian genocide. What about the Assyrian genocide that took place under the Ottomans? What about the Anatolian Greek genocide that took place under that? I mean, before Saddam, Iraq was 30% Christian. It's, it's less than a percent now. Who's looking at the totality of all of this and even understanding what's going on, how and why? And I would say they don't know anything. Basically, the people at the top know very, very, very little. And that's just proven time, 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 time again. But anyway. That's exactly what Peter Blaber is saying. What we want is, okay, one, I need to take personal responsibility for myself, my condition, everything, my gender, my age, my everything. I need to take personal responsibility and then start making things work for myself. What do I need to do? Is it difficult? Okay, so it's difficult. I swam from Alcatraz Island. And it wasn't even that difficult because I was very well prepared for it. You swam from Alcatraz? Yes. <laughs> I was doing triathlons in my 40s. And one of them was the Alcatraz Triathlon. I went up there to do that. And they had you jump off a boat about 100 meters offshore for the swim start, telling us that, well, don't go up there. There's glass on the beach and everything. And I'm thinking, at this, I'm not going to tell people I almost did it. So I swam, you know, trudged up the beach, hugged the rock. I was late for the swim start. But again, so I actually swam from Alcatraz. But the deal is, I mean, if you threw the average person in there, well, they drown. But if you prepare, was it easy? No, it's not easy. You got to work hard. You got to be regular. You got to give up things. You got da 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 da, right? You can do what you choose to do within possibility if you decide to and do it. And that's why I like to look back at great Americans, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, Booker T. Washington, and we could go on and on with a lot of other people in the process. My four or five times removed great grandfather was on Washington's personal staff. I mean, The fact that this ragtag army could beat the most powerful in the world was not something anybody would bet on. And look at what our ancestors accomplished and what people have accomplished throughout history. We want to look to those people and those mechanisms. And so in Namdi, we look to those things. That's what we're looking at here, only on a level that very few people can understand actually exists, which is why I need to touch people and stuff so they get, oh, this is really different because when they see me do it on video, they're not understanding, as you know from experience, they're not understanding how much is not being done. Even though it looks like a lot is happening, how much I'm not doing to make that happen. What a metaphor for life that would be. I would have helped myself a lot if I could have understood this earlier, but I couldn't hear earlier, metaphorically speaking, right? I had to go through what I had to go through. And we always say, if I knew then what I knew now, well, but it took this much for you to know this. At some point, there's going to be a book from James Williams called The Skillful Art of Non-Doing. Yeah, not doing anything, as uh, Alexis used to say. It's not about you. This is through marriage stuff. And the thing is, she's right in that sense of the term. <laughs> it, and, and I always tell people, listen, if you're the most important person in your life, I'm sorry for you. I am not the most important person in my life in that sense. 
I'm fortunate. And everything that you're doing is teaching empowerment so that people can make a positive contribution yes. to themselves, their loved ones, and their community. Yes, and get the most out of this experience. So the book that I'm working on, and I've been going back and forth, I was trying to – the Namidu book is so big, but I'm, I'm actually doing one on Namidu and aging and all of the things that – you know, going back, okay, well, why am I in the position I am in this? My goal is empowerment. The more empowered people are, the better society will have and the better lives they'll have. And if you have a better life, then your, your society is going to be better. If you want victim of excuses why not and anger against people and biases and all of that, and you can't listen to other the viewpoints without an angry, violent response, well, this is not going to work well for you as a person, but it's definitely not going to work well for society either. You know, we need to start with ourselves, right? The old biblical thing, get your own house in order first. This is uh, such an important thing. It's a fast journey. People, every now and then I'll hear the word master, this or that. And, and if you look at skill and knowledge versus other people that maybe use that term, easily could be applied. We don't use it. I don't use it. I don't identify with it. I'm a student still, and I'll be a student as a matter how much I know, even in relation to other people, because this knowledge is far more than any person is going to achieve in a lifetime. Stay a student. Stay humble. My job isn't to be, I'm the guy. My job is to, hey, can I help? As we wrap up, James, tell our listeners how people can learn more about what you've got going on and how to reach you. I have several Facebook pages, System of Strategy, James Williams. Our new Mountain River Dojo, which is in Bozeman, where I teach with the Kaicho Dai for Namidu, Jeff Green. I travel and do seminars around to other schools. So in Philadelphia, Richard Robinson uh, has a dojo there. In Flagstaff, Jim O'Connell has a dojo. In Seattle, Josh Ross. In Nashville, Brian Williams and J.J. Ebarb teach at two different places. In San Diego, Solana Beach, Adam Edwards, Austin Blue, Ryan Karangola are all teaching Namidu. In Reno, Ryan Belagante. And in Cologne, Germany, Anna Jacobson. I see on the Namidu com website that you also have Branch Dojo affiliated with Nami Ryu in Fresno, California and Ames, Iowa. So those are all places people can go. We also have seminars in all those places and seminars at the Mountain River Dojo. In May, Kurosu Tetsuzan will be here. In August, we have our gathering where we allow other people to come as well. So you can find that information on the different websites. I will include links in the show notes for all your various websites. EverydaySamurai.life forward slash 36. People can go to my YouTube channel, System of Strategy, and see free videos and stuff about a wide range of things that come from this. We do have our Namidu online training, which is very detailed and takes people through the more classical training. You know, when you go on systemofstrategy.com, you can also see my knives from CRKT and Williams Blade Design, which I have with my son, Christopher. So lots of ways of getting more information and knowledge there. And fortunately, we were able to see some of the pictures of the new dojo out in Bozeman. Tell us about that. Well, that's Jeff Green's fault. And Martin Eddy, who the young Marine that helped so much with everything, building, just pushing him to let's get a dojo going and we're going to have to put some money into this. And, you know, we took twice as long, literally, and twice as much money to put all of this together. But we built a really excellent training space, seminar space, place where people can gather, not just on the mat, but on top. We have a nice big area up there to study and learn. We're going to do filming out of there to increase our presence on online dojo and other things like that to help help spread this knowledge and really want to have as much positive impact on as many people as we can manage. And that is what the world needs a lot more of now. Well, we'll do our part the best we're able. Sensei Williams, I look forward to you coming back on the show. Thank you very much. I'll probably see you in Japan next year. And anytime you get here, you're welcome. And then point anybody else in our direction as well. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Thank you. Friends, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Everyday Samurai and look forward to seeing you next time. Be sure to subscribe to our feed so you never miss an episode. If you like what you've heard here, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcatcher. Share the show with a friend or someone you think would resonate with our message of building a community of warriors in service to liberty and the security of a free state. Check the show notes page at everydaysamurai.life forward slash 36 for links to where you can connect with William Sensei as well as his Nami Diu Aiki Heiho related training and products. While you're there, sign up for our email list so as to stay current with our latest offerings. Remember, wringing stress from the body to achieve the flow state is essential to success in life and combat, or anything in between that comes your way. So activate your optimal fitness potential at everydaysamurai.life forward slash primal. That's everydaysamurai.life forward slash primal. Until next time, stay sharp, stay aware, and be well.